1, estamos al aire. Buenos días a todos, eh, amigos de la Fundación Cario Infantil. Eh, en nombre de nuestra institución, quiero agradecerles el reunirse con nosotros porque tenemos el privilegio y el honor de presentar al doctor Yana, a, a Yana Bacán, que es eh, un experto en cirugía pediátrica, pero además uno de los líderes mundiales en la cirugía de Norwood híbrido. Y como ustedes saben, esta es una tendencia que ha tomado fuerza en algunas eh, partes del mundo. Y nosotros en la Fundación Infantil la estamos introduciendo desde hace un tiempo, basados en los protocolos que el doctor Jan los uh, terminó de elaborar. Eh, vamos a dar el siguiente paso, que es Tomás Chalela, otro de los cirujanos cardiovasculares de la Fundación Infantil. Va a ser la introducción oficial del doctor, John, del doctor Jan, eh, un leve recuento de su historia y, y su trayectoria como médico. Y posteriormente el doctor Jan continuará con su charla. Tomás, por favor. Eh, buenos días. Les recordamos que al conectarse a esta conferencia están autorizando el tratamiento de sus datos personales que serán tratados de acuerdo a la ley 1581 de 2012 y nuestra política de datos personales que puede ser consultada en la, la página www.cardioinfantil.org. De igual forma, les informamos que esta conferencia está siendo grabada. Eh, les recordamos que el chat de preguntas se encuentra habilitado en la barra de participantes y les agradecemos dejar allí sus preguntas que resolveremos al final de la sesión. Hoy tenemos en este nuevo gran round de la Fundación Cardio Infantil eh, un tema muy interesante. Vamos a hablar sobre el procedimiento de Norwood híbrido, cómo hacer un programa de Norwood híbrido, ya que este ha venido en auge, ha llegado a ser el procedimiento de elección en diversos grupos, por ejemplo, en Columbus, en Ohio, en Gizel, en Alemania o en Sao Paulo, en Brasil. Y todos estos grupos tienen en común que han adoptado o han basado su práctica de Norwood híbrido en el protocolo realizado por el grupo de la Universidad de Gizel en Alemania, protocolo que fue presentado en el Congreso de la Asociación Europea de Cirugía Cardiotorácica en 2016, realizado bajo la dirección del doctor Hakan Akintur y el doctor Jan Yerevacan, que nos está acompañando hoy. Doctor Yerevacan es un cirujano nacido en Estambul, en Turquía. Hizo sus estudios de medicina en la Universidad de Freiburg, en Alemania, y su residencia en el Deutsche Health Centrum, en Berlín. Posteriormente fue a Washington, en Estados Unidos, e hizo su fellowship en cirugía cardíaca pediátrica bajo la dirección del doctor eh, Richard Jonas. Como cirujano, ha trabajado en el Hospital Internacional Medical en Istanbul, luego en el Pediatric Heart Center de Gießen en Alemania, donde se desarrolló el protocolo del cual vamos a hablar hoy, y actualmente trabaja en el Children's National Heart Institute acompañando a Richard Jonas. Es además profesor asociado de cirugía y pediatría de la Universidad George Washington en Estados Unidos. Es autor y coautor de más de 80 artículos de cirugía cardíaca pediátrica, muchos de ellos sobre el tema del que nos va a hablar el día de hoy. Thank you very much, Dr. Yerevacan, for being with us today. It's a pleasure and a real honor to have you in our grand rounds. Please go on. Okay. Buenos uh, días. Uh, uh, you hear me very well, I think. Uh, you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you for the for the introduction, Dr. Sandoval and uh, Thomas. Thank you for organizing. It's a great privilege. Uh, it's a great privilege to to join you uh, in this uh, in this lecture. And uh, I'm very happy uh, to present on on a topic I I really uh, uh, like. And uh, my last uh, spent my seven last seven years uh, uh, trying to get an expertise on. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation now, uh, and uh, I greet everybody from Washington, D.C., United States. Um, I'm talking about the uh, hybrid strategy. The um, title is nicely picked by uh, Thomas, but I, it's a little bit provocative because um, I would I would um, uh, not really like it to, to call it a hybrid Norwood because it's it's a it's a different approach and it. Uh, the, therefore, I left it as it is, uh, but we, we would speak, speak more about a hybrid strategy or hybrid therapy for hypoplastic left heart syndrome rather than uh, the uh, hybrid Norwood operation. We will be talking about, um, about the uh, background, some uh, methods uh, we use uh, to treat uh, those challenging uh, patients uh, with uh, hypoplastic left heart physiology 
And um, I, I will try to give us uh, some tips what I have uh, learned, what we have learned over the last few years uh, to create a successful program. Um, so uh, not any presentation should uh, uh, proceed without mentioning uh, the great minds who opened, the, who paved the way to uh, uh, to the modern uh, uh, pediatric cardiac surgery uh, nowadays. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, it happened in the early 40s um, uh, where we started to think and uh, to treat these uh, babies doomed, so-called doomed babies and gave them a new life um, and uh, still trying to do that um, in, uh, in each circumstances. Um, it's true, we have a problem and that's the hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome is uh, shortly defined as, uh, as uh, uh, the um, uh, entity in, um, in, in, in pediatric cardiac uh, disease uh, where the left heart has hypoplastic structures in inflow, outflow and the ventricle itself. Uh, and, and cannot sustain a full cardiac output uh, after uh, birth. So uh, there is, uh, if there's a problem and there will be solutions, the, the principles of the solutions are uh, similar in each and every, uh, every uh, uh, possible treatment. Uh, and those are uh, the right ventricle, uh, we will use the right ventricle as the systemic heart chamber. Uh, we, we try to achieve a complete mixing of the blue and red blood in the heart uh, from pulmonary and systemic venous returns. We, 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 try to, we try to have an unobstructed systemic perfusion and outflow from the heart and a controlled pulmonary perfusion in order to aim at an equal QPQS as soon as possible. Uh, those principles were first applied one of the greatest minds, uh, greatest surgeons uh, in our field, uh, Bill Norwood, uh, in the in the late uh, 70s and um, uh, you know that was that was a, an excellent operation to uh, to treat these, these babies who were actually doomed to die in almost 100 percent of cases uh, in a few uh, weeks and months of uh, time. Uh, the Norwood operation itself uh, follows the principles we have already mentioned that means an unobstructed, unobstructed systemic uh, blood flow by reconstructing the aortic arch and combining uh, the aorta, the diminutive aorta with the pulmonary artery, uh, having an unobstructed uh, intraatrial septum by complete mixing and giving a controlled flow using a modified uh, uh, blood shunt uh, in the first phase is a central shunt, but later on a blade of shunt, but as well as lately uh, putting a sano shunt uh, from the right ventricular body to, uh, to the uh, pulmonary circulation. We have made big achievements uh, by uh, refining these results of the surgery um, and, um, and uh, as we have seen from the single ventricular reconstruction trial lately, despite all efforts, 40% of all these children do not reach uh, uh, the elementary school. And about 15, 20% of them have major deficits. So uh, while thinking about the results of uh, uh, cardiac surgery, pediatric cardiac surgery in other diseases, having a survival rates over 95%, in almost uh, uh, the entire population here, survival of uh, a 60 percent with major deficits at six years of age is not something we have to be satisfied. So uh, a big major problem is, of course, uh, with babies uh, who have a birth weight below 2.5 kilograms, and those babies reach a fontan circulation in lower than 40% of cases and this, this makes a major uh, impact on our overall uh, survival rates in congenital heart surgery. Well, this problem was uh, actually well recognized by our colleagues from the UK and they first uh, initiated the, uh, 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 another look at the paradigm and said, 
why don't we imitate the fetal circulation by stenting, keeping the arterial duct open by stenting and, and restricting the pulmonary blood flow, where, as well as opening the intraatrial septum uh, by interventional means. So they have done it with two, four babies and, uh, you know, achieved success in two. Uh, and that was the start of all the hybrid efforts uh, worldwide. So, well, uh, the, the uh, principles are the same, whereas the hybrid palliation in terms in comparison to Norwood palliation uh, tries to imitate the uh, uh, fetus circulation as it is bending, bilateral bending of the both pulmonary arteries keeping the systemic outflow open by stenting the ductus arteriosus and as well as, if needed, opening the intraarterial septum either by uh, um, septostomy or implanting a stent. Um, where, wh well, what are the differences? Well, the normal palliation is a big neonatal surgery. Uh, in most of the centers, need for hypothermia, hypothermic circulatory arrest, uh, and need for cardiopulmonary bypass, obviously, and uh, has an operative mortality in the best sense, 15%, but in most of the cases, uh, in mean 20% initially. Whereas the hybrid palliation is a minimal neonatal surgery, uh, does not need the cardiopulmonary bypass as an operative stage one mortality between 2 to 5% in dedicated centers. Uh, okay, well, we have bilateral pulmonary artery bands and uh, a stent in the ductus arteriosus, which is uh, um, criticized by the opponents, and that we, we do accept. Um, so the stage palliation in both ways, and I wouldn't concentrate on the Norwood, but in the hybrid uh, actually is different in that, that we have a minimal surgery with bilateral pulmonary artery banding and ductus standing in the neonatal phase and proceed with the comprehensive stage two operation, how we call it, which combines both the Norwood operation at the initial stage and the Glenn operation in one stage. At four to six months of age, preferentially not below five kilograms of patients, and both pathways uh, lead to the so-called uh, total cavopulmonary connection or the Fontan operation at the end. Uh, I had the privilege to work with the Giesen team for over four years uh, with Dr. Akin Turk and Dr. Dietmar who pioneered this approach in, in, in Germany and, um, and uh, gave the first uh, publication where they uh, have uh, brought these patients to stage two, the so-called so comprehensive stage two operations successfully. Um, they have also uh, concluded that uh, they have shown first time that uh, the bilateral pulmonary artery bending with ductal standing in newborns with hypoplastic left heart syndrome can successfully lead to neoartic reconstruction and uh, lead to bidirectional pulmonary connection in the second stage. Um, the stage one hybrid procedure uh, um, requires uh, this uh, um, implantation of surgical bilateral pulmonary artery bands of three millimeter width in babies who were generally speaking below three kilograms of weight and um, um, and uh, 3.5 uh, 3.5 millimeter bands above three, three kilograms of bird weight and ductal stenting is uh, followed in the catheterization laboratory two to four days after the uh, after this procedure surgical procedure uh, and uh, important, the most important thing in probably uh, this uh, slide is that you see that the babies and the time of the ductal stenting are not intubated. And um, uh, that is the Giesen approach to that. Um, and the procedure is being done uh, through a four French terumo sheet and um, um, in a uh, 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 arterial access and a retrograde stenting of the dart, which takes uh, a very short time, minimally invasive to the baby. And that's an important, it's not my expertise in the cat la uh, lab, but I think this is one of the most important, um, important uh, differences to the rest of the programs who, uh, which, uh, which pursue the hybrid pathway. Well, uh, without uh, mentioning the material we use in these uh, in these uh, um, uh, babies, the so-called specifically designed ductal stents, and I want to quote Dr. Schranz in this um, in this uh, lecture, who said uh, the duct 
uh, aorta ductal junction in these babies are, are like noses uh, of people. They are all different. That you have, you cannot treat them with one type of stent, one length of stent. Therefore, uh, the uh, company Optimate uh, created uh, different stent lengths with different widths and uh, very pliable stents for these babies. And uh, fortunately, we were able in the United States to get a compassionate use approval for the stents and are using them since few months in the United States uh, as expanded access um, without so far FDA approval, full FDA approval. But I recommend uh, for every hybrid program to explore the opportunity. Well, let's get to uh, to some of the details of uh, the surgical procedures. Um, uh, so important steps I want to mention for my surgical colleagues uh, for the bilateral pulmonary artery bending at the first stage. So we we try to, uh, as always, we try to uh, pursue a meticulous technique with minimal trauma throughout the procedure. Uh, and even if it seems a little bit trivial, do not open the pleura. Uh, a very bloodless surgery in the first surgery. I always say the comprehensive stage two operation starts with the stage one operation. It does not start at four months of age. Therefore, we have to be taking care of the stage one procedure uh, very carefully. We do only a per partial pericardiotomy in this case in the upper part of the pericardium just as much as we can put the bands on. A very limited dissection only on the band sides on the pulmonary arteries is needed. We cut, and that is important, narrow discs of a Gore-Tex tube, one to one five, one point five millimeter width for bending on each side. And I will show the video later. You will see that, and that's an, a very important other aspect of the procedure that we do not end up with hypoplastic pulmonary arteries at the stage second stage of the procedure. Fixation of the bands on the adventitia of the branch pulmonary arteries, extremely important. We do not want the bands to slide to the periphery and again end up with uh, hypoplastic branch pulmonary arteries, which uh, sometimes uh, uh, gives us babies uh, who are not amenable to go to the second stage. We do not want any bleeding into pericardium before we close it. We wash the pericardium and make sure there is not even one drop in the pericardium to prevent adhesions for the second stage for the most complex procedure, uh, for one of the most complex procedures in pedicard pediatric cardiac surgery, the so-called comprehensive stage two operation. We complete the closure, we completely close the pericardium at the end of the procedure with six of PDS suture. Let's see um, uh, in a short video how we uh, do this. So um, a sternotomy, uh, almost subtotal resection of the um, thymus, limited pericardiotomy, state sutures placed on the pericardium, very narrow Gore-Tex bands, as you see here, one to 1.5 millimeter in width. We use six soprolane sutures for the bands and very limited dissection on the branch pulmonary arteries, proximal placement of the right band just next to the aorta in this case. So once the band is placed, the band is fixed with the same suture in the adventitia of the vessel. And Subsequently, the band, the suture is tied and the pulmonary artery is banded. And similarly, on the left side, very limited dissection, band is pulled through and fixed on the adventitia proximally as proximal as possible. And we close the pericardium completely by just leaving one chest tube retrosternally in these patients. Um, so, well, the hybrid strategy is not a strategy just only for a univentricular palliation of the patient. It can give us uh, uh, many options. It does not burn any bridges. That, that's a good thing with the hybrid strategy. We can do, we can pursue to univentricular palliation. We can to, do, go for a biventricular repair in hypoplastic left heart complex, as well as we can bridge the patients to cardiac transplantation. And uh, these pathways are possible also going uh, to the uh, sides of the uh, um, uh, strategy. So let's talk about the univentricular palliation. 
Uh, in the neonatal period, as you have mentioned already, ductal standing and bilateral pulmonary artery bending at four to six months of age, at about six kilograms, uh, we pursue with the comprehensive stage two operation. Uh, I was I had the privilege to uh, publish the results from the Giesen group uh, back in 2016. Uh, uh, there were 182 uh, uh, patients at that point. I think that not right now they have reached over 250 patients, uh, the group. Um, and we have shown in these results uh, for the first time worldwide that we can achieve in all patients group over 80% survival, almost 80% survival. Uh, 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 without difference in patients with the highest risk group with AA and MA mitral and aortic atresia, uh, equal, almost equal survival. And um, that has actually attracted a lot of attention worldwide. Similarly, survival of these patients below 2.5 kilograms was similar to those who were above 2.5 kilograms at birth. So, well, I, this is a lot of um, uh, text here. I don't want to go into the details. In this publication, however, I think the most important part for my all colleagues from anesthesia, from cardiology, pediatric cardiology, also, as well as surgery, is the last part. And there's a supplemental file is table A, E1 and E2. And I have, I have tried for all people in the world to, to, to understand how the Giesen procedure went and in detail described uh, the standards for anesthesia, for uh, cardiology and cardiac surgery in this uh, in this um, uh, part of this paper. And um, I don't want to again go into details with that, but all uh, the entire every word in this uh, in this section is very important to have a successful hybrid program to achieve the results which the Giesing group was achieving for the last 15 years. As well as uh, the Comprehensive stage two operation is concerned. Again, this is one of the most complex procedures um, in, which we do in pediatric cardiac surgery and therefore not really uh, favorized by many surgeons worldwide. But there is a there is a way to do this operation very, very safely. And I have learned this from uh, learned this from Dr. Akenturk. Um, and and uh, if you follow these principles, uh, this operation is a quite safe operation with very good results. Below 5% of uh, operative mortality it can be done in all patients. We do use selective regional cerebral perfusion at 28 degrees Celsius uh, in these patients with the end to side graph. We do uh, most of the procedure uh, except the, uh, uh, and obviously the uh, the aortic artery reconstruction on beating heart, atrial septectomy, bilateral DPA debanding, um, LPA reconstruction, bidirectional gland anastomosis, all on beating heart. We do use anti-grade custodial crystal cardioplegia for these cases, and the uh, cardioplegic time does not um, um, access the 60 minutes, 70 minutes mark in most of the cases uh, until we complete the arch reconstruction. We do, we try to completely remove the stents from the ducts arteriosus, which is not necessarily possible with stents that has been, uh, that have been used worldwide um, and which are the peripheral um, uh, adult uh, vascular stents uh, for ductal standing. These stents cannot be fully removed and I don't think these stents should be used in hybrid procedures at all. Uh, we do the DKS anastomosis and we pursue with the arch reconstruction using a preformed curved aortic arch conduit. Uh, and it we use nowadays the CardioSat 3D patch for that. So, well, uh, a very short video again, how I would uh, uh, do this operation. Um, um, so this is a seven month old female with HLHS, uh, AS, uh, MS, uh, Kawasaki disease, hybrid uh, stage one. You see there is almost no pericardial adhesion in the second stage if we close the pericardium. Right now we are controlling the ducts arteriosus in the um, beginning of the operation as always uh, before we go on cardiopulmonary bypass. The innominate artery is cannulated through to end to side graft, um, seven or eight or sutures to fix the graft. We go on bypass, control the duct. Uh, I always use the bicable cannulation. On beating cart, we do the atrial septectomy here. Uh, we are at that point cooling the patient to 28 degrees Celsius. Closure of the 
in, uh, um, write atrium uh, with a PDS suture. We open, this is all on beating card. As you see, we open the main pulmonary artery, remove the left band. The Hagar dilation of the carefully of the left pulmonary artery. Most of the times we prefer a pericardial reconstruction of the left pulmonary artery, which remains one of our challenges uh, in the comprehensive stage two operation. Similarly, the right band is removed. The right pulmonary artery is dilated with the pulmonary artery uh, beta Hagar, and the gland anastomosis is accomplished. We use a PDS suture again here, 70, and right now we are in selective cerebral perfusion. We are removing the ductal stent uh, from the aorta. Unfortunately, this ductal stent is a uh, peripheral vascular stent because we didn't have access at that time. This is a curved patch for a cardio cell, uh, which we use for aortic arch reconstruction. 70 or 80 sutures, uh, depending on the tissue quality here, is being used. And the DKS anastomosis uh, amalgamation of the PA with the aorta has been accomplished. And uh, we pursue further with the aortic arch reconstruction, which again takes us about uh, 40 to 50 minutes at most uh, at 28 degree, eight degrees Celsius and sagittal depression, the airing of the heart and uh, giving free to perfusion. So, um, so, after these all uh, publications, I think uh, worldwide there was, uh, there was an interest in hybrid procedure. Most of the centers, though, preserving this type of uh, strategy for the highest risk patients. But um, uh, in this study <clears throat> uh, in the United States, uh, uh, in the, from the CHSS, uh, 564 babies were analyzed. Uh, only 20% though undergoing the hybrid procedure. And mostly these um, hybrid procedures are done in one center in the United States, other centers occasionally applying to procedures. So not much expertise um, uh, in most of the centers. Uh, they have seen that the hybrid procedure uh, had a similar survival rate um, after stage one at uh, about four years uh, in comparison to Norwood PT shunt. Uh, was inferior to the RV to PA conduit, so-called SANO shunt. Um, however, what they have seen was that the hybrid procedure was particularly helpful in babies uh, below 2.5 kilogram. Again, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the hybrid procedure is being done uh, differently in different centers, and the expertise sometimes in some centers is not more than um, uh, two to five cases a year, and that is a limiting factor, um, and um, um, therefore we have to accept these results with caution. Um, well, there, are there problems with hybrid procedures? Of course there are problems, uh, and uh, as I have already mentioned, the, uh, keeping the LPA, the small LPA open, as with the normal procedures, is a challenge in these patients, and we do sometimes have um, thrombotic occlusion of the um, LPA after the comprehensive stage two operation, which is um, treated with a stent implantation uh, into the LPA. Um, uh, some people say, oh no, this is a no-go. No, it's not, because uh, during the um, Fontana operation, we can actually remove the stent, cut into the stent, and augment this, uh, this part with the, um, uh, with the Fontana conduit. And uh, this works pretty well as uh, we have uh, reported from Giesen uh, with a very good survival after the Fontan procedure and pulmonary artery growth. And we have shown this. We have shown this in the MRI results from Giesen that we have shown uh, growth of the pulmonary arteries of both pulmonary arteries to the Fontan procedure. Okay, I um, uh, would admit that we have a high uh, rate of PA reintervention in the hybrids and at 10 years, about 60% of patients get any type of PA intervention. Most of these interventions are in the initial phase. Um, that is true. Um, but uh, this, these rates uh, sometimes are similar to the Norwood results uh, in, in, in other centers. So uh, what are key factors for success in, the, in, the high, in a hybrid program? I would say the first one is the teamwork. Hybrid means also hybrid work from uh, through different teams. Uh, that means uh, the uh, uh, P 
pediatric cardiac surgery has to uh, be very close to pediatric cardiology for the for a successful heart program. Also, anesthesiology, intensive care, every single step is important, and these teams have to work together, have to concentrate on this patient all together. We have to have the right material and medications. I will. I have already mentioned the right materials. Uh, we have to use the specific doctor stents um, uh, for these patients. These doctor stents cost about six thousand, seven thousand dollars. But we are implanting towers in. Um, uh, we are doing towers in adult patients, eighty years of age, uh, for uh, sixty, seventy thousand dollars, and do not care. And we have to find the right material for these kids to give them uh, 20, 30, 40 years of life. Um, and uh, we have to spend money on this. This is this is this is completely all right. And we have to use the right material for the for the right patients. Medications I will mention at the end of the presentation, and it's not my expertise, but um, uh, Dr. Schranz has published a lot of, of that, and I think it's extremely important to use heart failure medication in in these patients. We have to meticulously plan surgical. I have no doubt that you have the uh, capability to do that, and I have shown uh, some of the some of the critical critical uh, features of that. Okay, well now, um, uh, and we have to write them many times, not only three times, uh, maybe ten times. Interstage follow up is the key factor for success of a hybrid program. We have to follow these patients regularly with first weekly and then then. Uh, bi-weekly echocardiographic uh, imaging during the interstage period. The hybrid patients do create complications, but they are easy to uh, easy to see. They are easy to um, easy to uh, recognize. They are um, uh, they can be picked up in the echocardiography and they can be treated that so that these patients move safely to comprehensive stage two operations. So interstage follow up is extremely important to lower the mortality. Uh, and post intensive uh, post comprehensive stage two intensive care management is in, in itself a, a, a big deal. Uh, early extubation of the patients after the comprehensive stage two operation be, uh, uh, and possibly uh, below six hours uh, after the operation is uh, one of the key factors for success. Well, uh, the uh, unimentricular palliation is the one thing. The hypoplastic left heart syndrome gives a small gives us a small left heart. That's true. But how small is small? And we were we have been struggling with this for many many years. Sometimes we don't know uh, whether these patients will work. And the mid part of the spectrum where we have a smallish left heart, we don't know uh, what will happen with this left heart. Is the most critical patient population. It's very hard to decide on these patients whether these patients will undergo a biventricular or univentricular palliation. Well, as we know, the hypoplastic left heart syndrome is not a hypoplastic left heart uh, complex. The a term which was coined by uh, Dr. Chawanko and said this is a subset of patients at the favorable end of the spectrum and is characterized by the hyperplasia of the structures of the left aorta left heart aorta complex. Uh, this consists of aortic and mitral valve hyperplasia without valve stenosis, hyperplasia of the left ventricle, hyperplasia of the left ventricle, alpha tract, uh, and so on. Uh, well, we have, in uh, um, uh, as to summarize, borderline obstructive left heart structures, a duct-dependent circulation of the lower body, and integrate flow through the ascending aorta. The only exception to that is an aortic atresia with VSD, with, uh, which can achieve a two-ventricular uh, repair with two ventricles. Um, and in this subset of patients, again, a CHHS study on 362 babies has shown that if we inappropriately pursue a biventricular repair in patients with borderline left heart structures, the mortality doubles and triples in, uh, in these cases. Um, well, the hybrid strategy ha can help us in that subset too. So we can, uh, we can Pursue the hybrid strategy and do not have to decide in the neonatal period whether these patients should undergo univentricular or biventricular repair. We can decide it at six months of age without any problems and give the left ventricle the time to grow the left ventricle structures. And we have shown that uh, back in 2015 from Giesen again um, with 40 patients uh, with uh, hypoplastic left heart syndrome and variants. 
uh, who underwent a biventricular repair at uh, about um, uh, six months of age um, uh, and with different types of uh, repairs and they achieved 90% uh, survival at 10 years in these patients. But the Gieson hybrid procedure for the borderline left ventricle with bilateral PA banding and standing of the duct pursues the same physiologic cause. We have an unobstructed systemic blood flow to the lower body. We have a protection of the pulmonary vascular bed for the next stages of palliation, even if we have to undergo, we even have to, even have to proceed with the univentricular pathway, and we have chance of growth potential for the left heart. Well, the standard surgical procedures are uh, self-explaining here that uh, we again use selective cerebral perfusion for the artery construction. We use selective myocardial perfusion in these cases. So sometimes these patients, if we do the Fontan procedure on beating card, do not see any ca cardioplegic arrest during their palliation, uh, even if they undergo a single ventricle palliation pathway. So stage one without cardiac arrest, stage two without cardiac arrest, and stage three without cardiac arrest. Uh, we do the debanding of the PAs, we remove the stand as always, and we do LP and RP reconstruction on the sides or Hagar dilation and an aortic artery reconstruction. Well, the Giesen group has, uh, has shown this, uh, as I have already mentioned, um, uh, different types of repairs um, and, um, uh, and different types of also uh, accompanying procedures. Um, and uh, that's the good thing with the Gieson hybrid procedure. So we do not have to intervene on the aortic valve, mitral valve uh, in the neonatal phase. We can do it later on at six to seven months of age so that um, the risk of the procedures, accompanying procedure is lowered. Um, Again, the 90% of survival uh, at 10 years uh, actually speaks uh, for itself uh, in this challenging patient population. So the decision making process at a later age uh, gives us the opportunity to differentiate better between the biventricular and univentricular patients. So uh, to my all pediatric cardiac uh, um, uh, colleagues, that is a uh, 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 known score, a discriminant score. Basically, it it gives us the opportunity to uh, to differentiate uh, in a in a population of aortic stenosis patients whether patients are have a good enough um, um, developed cardiac uh, structures on the left side to pursue a biventricular repair. We applied this discriminant score retrospectively to our hybrid population. We saw. At stage one, if we apply the score, many of the patients would not uh, 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 qualify for a univentricular, uh, for a biventricular palliation and would have stayed in the univentricular palliation pathway according to the discriminant score. If we had applied the score at the type of the biventricular repair at six months of age, you see uh, many of the patients would now have qualified uh, for the biventricular repair. And that is a win uh, for this patient population. So uh, mentioning that, please let me add some uh, few more things um, which ha we have added to our uh, pathway in, G uh, in the Washington DC during the last few years and the so-called delayed Norwood operation without, um, without um, uh, leaving that open in patients where we can mitigate the risk factors for a Norwood operation where we have modifiable risk factors, we can recover organ dysfunction within four to six weeks just with palm, uh, bilateral pulmonary artery bending plus minus standing or PGE infusion. Uh, we can also safely do a delayed Norwood operation in these patients. Um, um, and and uh, the risk factors, we do only treat hybrid patients in Washington DC still for, uh, for high risk uh, neonates. Uh, and uh, these high risk features are known to all of us, but just to mention shortly, prematurity, birth weight below 2.5, genetic abnormalities, heterotaxy syndrome, um, uh, significant extra cardiac anomalies, uh, shock uh, situation before, before the surgery, and of course the borderline left heart, as I have mentioned, uh, which is not amenable or high risk for primary biventricular repair are the uh, uh, indications, as well as high risk anatomy, with myocardial dysfunction or uh, moderate TR are considered as a as risk factor for a Norwood operation in this patient group. Um, uh, in the delayed Norwood operation, uh, similarly, 
it's very similar. I do it uh, with the, uh, uh, similar to the comprehensive stage two operation. Uh, uh, I apologize for the video. It's a little bit off, uh, of focus, but as you see, there are no pericardial uh, adhesions also in these patients. Selective cerebral perfusion in these patients, uh, again, um, as in a similar uh, fashion, um, we do remove the bands on both sides. Um, uh, all at uh, all steps up to the aortic arch reconstruction on beating heart. Uh, the aortic reconstruction, we dilate the uh, both branch PAs. Um, mostly a simple Hagar dilation in this patient is enough without the need for reconstruction of the LPA. Selective cerebral perfusion, aortic arch reconstruction with a curved pericardial patch. And uh, just to uh, scroll a bit forward, and uh, we do pursue with a PT shunt modified PT shunt uh, um, in this patient. So uh, we have uh, done about 26 patients with uh, treated with 26 patients with a hybrid uh, approach in Washington DC in the last uh, two and a half years. Uh, and um, from those seven patients underwent a delayed Norwood operation, three patients underwent bioventricular repair, six patients underwent comprehensive stage two operation. Uh, whereas now, uh, for now, uh, seven patients are waiting switch stage three operation. So what we have achieved was a survival. This is the highest risk population um, in, in, the, in our uh, subset. Um, and as you see, the birth weights in this patient is the median is 2.4 uh, kilograms. Um, I understand the results are quite new, so we don't have a, a long median follow-up uh, since we have started the program in December 2017. But the survival, over survival is uh, almost uh, equal to a normal uh, uh, and non-high risk uh, Norwood po population. Uh, particularly, uh, the survival in uh, single stages is very, very high. I think we have to work on interstage, still interstage uh, mortalities in order to make it perfect. But I'm very optimistic about that. Um, uh, what I have mentioned a uh, few slides um, ahead is um, the medical therapy in this patient. And Dr. Schranz, again, I don't want to go into details with that one also, but Dr. Schranz, I recommend you this paper uh, has published on that. And the so-called BAS therapy, uh, uh, it makes very much sense. A beta blocker to decrease the demand uh, of the myocardium, uh, ACE inhibitors uh, to decrease the afterload, and spironolactone for uh, for diuretic and the right ventricular remodeling in these patients, uh, we have shown is very helpful over long term to achieve a higher survival uh, in this patient group. And ultimately, I think uh, in the future, we have to, um, um, and as a perspective, uh, critically, um, critically uh, evaluate our neurodevelopmental outcome in this patient's group and uh, quality of life in these children. Uh, the Giesing group in, in um, collaboration with the Swiss group has already started to do that. And uh, the initial results are uh, very, very uh, favorable. And my colleague, Dr. Reich, um, uh, has published few papers on that. I, I, I recommend you to, the, uh, to read these papers. These are um, actually nice uh, neurodevelopmental outcome data from the hybrid population. I would like to thank all my colleagues who helped uh, to establish the hybrid program in Washington DC, particularly uh, my uh, 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 long mentor uh, for the last 10 years, uh, Dr. Richard Jonas, who, uh, who has supported me uh, tremendously uh, during the last uh, 10 years. Uh, and um, I uh, have really always appreciated that. Uh, I thank you for your attention. It was again a big privilege, a huge privilege uh, to uh, be able to present you uh, uh, my views on this um, on this topic, and um, I am very happy to answer if there are any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jan, for your spectacular lecture, and uh, and um, of course we are very impressed with this. Uh, uh, 
protocols that you have uh, um, implanted or, or put together in, in many centers. So we're going to start with some uh, questions from the audience. One is the, the first one is the, if the baby has a, a tricuspid insufficiency that is a moderate, uh, would you proceed with the hybrid procedure? Is the first question. This is um, uh, this is a very good and interesting question. Uh, yes, we would. Uh, so it depends on uh, the uh, on the uh, type of the tricuspid insufficiency, of course. Uh, if this is a cause, sometimes it's the case by a dilated uh, neonatal right ventricle postnatally, uh, we uh, we do pursue the hybrid approach and hope uh, that uh, with the recompensation of the circulation that. This TR uh, would be would be uh, would improve. Uh, well, now um, it is a risk factor for the hybrid uh, hybrid uh, subset too. We do we do have to know that. Um, um, but I think uh, it is uh, unreasonable uh, to have a tricuspid regurgitation and go in the neonatal phase for a high risk Norwood operation because these patients would struggle quite considerably after a Norwood procedure. We have actually one recent case uh, with uh, severe right ventricular risk dysfunction, uh, tricus severe tricuspid regurgitation, actually a big baby from a diabetic mother, 4.1 kilograms, which we have treated with hybrid procedure. This baby improved the right ventricular dysfunction quite considerably, whereas the tricuspid regurg stayed the same on the moderate to severe range. Um, we have then decided to proceed with the hybrid uh, pathway by stenting the duct, uh, duct act after pulmonary artery bending. And um, since the tricuspid regurgitation did not improve, we did not pursue the comprehensive stage two, but we we went to cardiac transplant. The baby is doing well at home now after cardiac transplant. So these are the, all the different options the hybrid offers us. Uh, so we can we don't burn any bridges for biventricular repair, univentricular palliation, and heart transplantation. And that's the good thing. We're not uh, we're we're not at the end of the therapy at some point because if you do the Norwood procedure in a kid with a tricuspid regurgitation and the circulation is failing and you have to do a tricuspid, uh, uh, tri tricuspid plasty, um, uh, we know how the results are in this subset. Okay, we have another uh, question regardless of, uh, of timing. Uh, when do you do the atriceptectomy after the stent, uh, uh, double stenting? When? When? Yes. So, um, so we after pulmonary artery banding, uh, the patient would come to the intensive care unit. We have at that point two to four days of time to assess what's going on. Unless the baby already presents with a with an obstructed intraatrial septum, then we have to solve it right away. If we have in the echocardiography suspicion at the interatrial septum is uh, not sufficient, as well as clinical suspicion that the mixing is inadequate uh, at the first place. We would, we would ban the patient and go directly for atriostatostomy in order to stabilize. If we just have a gradient, but the patient is clinically doing well, the mixing is fine, we can wait until doctor is standing and do both at the same time. This is a that's a dynamic decision in the process. Sometimes our cardiologists tell us most of the babies in our center are prenatal diagnosed, so we know whether they are coming with intact septum, they are being obstructed septum. Once the baby is born, we reassess. I do not think it's reasonable if unless it's intact septum to go uh, to a atrioseptostomy. Um, before banding in these procedures because it's very hard to control the opening and the baby after that has risk of uh, inadequate circulation, a lot of pulmonary blood flow and do not want to go to an urgent pulmonary artery banding. So it makes sense to wait the clinical picture to see whether there is adequate mixing to ban the patient to reassess either go for an early 
atraceptostomy after banding or uh, defer it to the time of the ductal stenting. Septostomy plus minus stenting of the intraceptal septum. And we, I, I prefer stenting of the intraceptal septum if there is any doubt, because it's sometimes very hard in these babies, and our, our interventionists will know that, to open up the septum just with the balloon. Okay, we have a couple more questions. What type of pre-op studies do you use routinely? Do you do MRI or how do you look for extra cardiac comorbidities? So, um, uh, in general, echocardiography is, is the tool we use. So that's, you know, besides all uh, research studies with brain MRIs, et cetera, et cetera, what we do, but for us, the important findings are in the, in the echocardiography unless we have um, severe extra cardiac anomalies and we want to explore the um, uh, vascular and cardiac anatomy, uh, let's say we have a dextrocardia, this and that, et cetera, um, there we, in variants, we would, we would pursue an MRI. Uh, so, well, now from, it's different from centers to test center. In Gieson, the MRI was, uh, was, uh, um, a standard procedure, more or less, for uh, many babies, because uh, the center, the pediatric cardiac center, had its own MRI. So its own MRI. So uh, here, um, it's from the radiology. It makes logis logistically different. So we have to make the indication a little bit more narrow. Uh, MRI is my, uh, in most of the cases not not necessary. Echocardiography, preoperatively. A uh, clinical picture of the patient gives actually a lot of information uh, once you pursue with uh, the saturations above and below uh, the uh, clinical picture of the patient, tachycardia, tachypnea, etc., etc. That gives you actually most of the information what you need. As you said in your presentation, the ductal aortic junction is very different patient to patient. How often do you see a retrograde coarctation and how do you manage it? Even when the patient had a prostaglandin infusion, it's not easy to to detect that. Correct, correct. This is this is an important point. Um, uh, no, now I, I I had the privilege to see both uh, sides. So the United States experience and the the um, the Giesen experience. This is indifferent in that that the type of the ductal stent is different. So that's why I mentioned it, and it plays a big role. So, so the aortic ductal junction is different in every single case. So um, the length of the stent plays a big role in the uh, percentage of the retrograde arch uh, problems in these patients. So it makes a difference whether you have to overstand the retrograde arch in each and every case with a 20 millimeter stent all the way in a 1.6 kilogram baby or not. So, um, in Eason, the rate of the uh, retrograde coarctation in these patients were below 10%. So, once the baby has been stented, prostaglandin infusion is off, the baby comes to the intensive care unit, and you will do daily echocardiographies uh, to see the retrograde arch. Um, the retrograde arch velocity, and uh, that is uh, that is what we see as an arbitrary value, and that comes from Giesen, about 3.1 meters per second and above. Very high suspicion for red. Well, this is not the only value because it can change with the blood pressure of the patient, etc., etc. So what we monitor is the right arm pressure in a patient, let's say, with an aortic atresia versus leg pressure, and not only the blood pressure, it's also the systolic and diastolic blood pressure. Once the pulse pressure of the patient goes down, you have to be highly suspicious, even if your echocardiography is fine, that there is something going on in the retrograde heart and the patient is not perfusing. On top of that, uh, if we, if we, uh, we can offer the the brachiocephalic trunk and the middle cerebral artery for the pulse wave dopplers and gain some hints whether the red rate arch is perfusing enough. So these are few few of the um, clinical findings 
we can um, we can see after doctor sending early in the first few days uh, whether the retrograde arch becomes a problem. If it becomes a problem, there is no doubt that we go to the cat laboratory and there is a from optimal company there is a specific retrograde art sinus superflex repo stent. Um, you can place directly into the retrograde arch. The good thing with the stent is that you can place it and after placement manipulate it at about 80% of the stent length in and out. So you can precisely the stent in the retrograde arch. And with that approach, these have been very successful to treat these patients and bring them successfully comprehensive stage two operation. I must say, I have not been watching see we are not at that stage. So, but so aggressively treating that and using the right material for indication. But we are getting there, it takes time. Okay, one of our anesthesiologists is asking about the experience in this patient with ECMO therapy. Well, uh, so, so I have to confess, uh, the first patient um, uh, I have put on ECMO after um, after stage one procedure uh, was recent, actually a few days ago, very sad, but uh, was at home was doing fine, came with cardiogenic shock and, um, um, well, had a post-doc coarctation which we have not uh, seen and we have to admit that. And uh, this patient, uh, I have <coughs> more um, uh, it's neck. It's complicated. It's complicated. So when these patients come in, um, um, I chose in this, in this um, precarious situation to put the patient on uh, ECMO through the neck uh, vessels because I didn't want to open the chest in a in a, a setting on the normal ward uh, where the patient uh, coded and we didn't know whether the patient was COVID positive or not so with all precautions. Um, um, so ECMO after stage one uh, I think if you if you have to do that then, um, uh, and it's a it's an elective setting then I would prefer the median sternotomy approach. Since we, since we do close the pericardium, it gives you almost a naked chest. So it's, it's for the surgeons. It's a standard that we, which I do every day. Can lay ducts and can lay the RA. Yeah. If it's, a, it's in, a, in, a, in an urgent setting, then I would go to the neck. So after comprehensive stage two operation, <clears throat> um, the patients, uh, um, there is only in the, in the um, uh, Washington DC experience, there was only one patient. We electively went on ECMO after comprehensive stage two with LPA obstruction, uh, where we went with ECMO to the CAT lab, stent the LPA and came off ECMO after two days. So, um, but in general, the number of the patients uh, who go on ECMO, the Giesen experience is below 5%. I think we have time for two more questions. The first one would be, as you said, you have to do echocardiogram every day on the patients after stage one, uh, comprehensive stage one. Is there any values to say that the bilateral pulmonary band are loose or you need to, or are too tight? How do you know that bilateral banding is adequate? Okay. So um, it's, it's in a presentation, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's quite hard and I think I, I had to mention it maybe. So generally speaking, pulmonary artery band, um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, classically uh, AAMA patient below three kilograms gets a 3.0 band. Patient above three kilograms gets a 3.5 millimeter band, uh, Gore-Tex band. So well, now if you have a 1.6 kilogram patient, uh, you still choose a 3.0 band. Uh, what I would do in this case is not measure the band uh, width again or diameter again, put the 3.0, but make it arbitrarily a little uh, tighter than I would do in a three kilogram patient. There was, there is no such method which can give you the exact uh, uh, band diameter in these patients to say, okay, now, 
you will put a 2.5 millimeter band and you will be fine after three months. That won't happen. And going in and out surgically for the band, oh, now it's too tight, now it's too loose, is not the right way to pursue in these patients. The less surgery in these patients, the better. Therefore, that's what I have learned from the big Gissing experience. Um, put 3.0 bands in all patients below 3 kilograms, unless this patient is a patient amenable for biventricular repair. Then I would choose maybe if you are 2.8, I would choose the 3.5 band. But this is but but this is another subset. Let's stay on the hypoplastic left heart. 3.0 band. Put them on. Come to the intensive care and treat the patient medically. We can treat a heart failure, the QPQS of two to one in every center worldwide. So what we can do is we can put the patient on beta blocker, bring the heart rate down to in sleeping mode 220 to 140 at rest. We can, we can put the patient on a tissue ACE inhibitor, lisinopril, uh, reduce the afterload, and we can treat the patient with as less diuretics in terms of LASIK as possible, give spironolactone, a little LASIK, LASIK maybe hydrochlorothiazide on top of that, and treat the patient to grow into the band. Now, this is, this is a tense setting. This is a tense setting where the intensive care physician become sometimes ex um, uh, worried about all oh, the patients over circuit and the circulation is not not working but you have to be patient to let the patient grow with medical therapy to the bands this is the way to success it's not the way to success to tell the surgeon oh no the patient is now your bands is too tight or too loose unless the band has loosened up and you, you have just one meters per second that is fine then you go ahead and then fix it but if you have band gradients postoperatively in a 2.5 kilogram patient with three bands, 2.5 meters per second each side with a blood pressure and always in the context of the blood pressure of 60 systolic to 35 diastolic, you're fine. You just treat the, med you just treat the patient medically and the patient will grow into the bands. That's the success. Um, and that's what I have learned from the Gieson experience. That's what we have to do. And the last question would be, I think it might be a tough one. When would you not uh, take the patient to the stage one? When would you give compassionate treatment? What do you think about that? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> um, there, um, in the Gieson experience, to give some data, there are in the beginning um, six or seven patients uh, who went to compassionate care. Um, I think if the patient has trisomy 13, trisomy 18, and the, and you talk to the family and they do not want to pursue the long single vertical pathway, I think there are ways then to to just say, okay, we we'll ban the patient, leave the patient on prostaglandin, and see how that goes. So that the hybrid option gives you even the time for decision. You don't have to decide right away. I mean, you can say the family. You know what? We can treat the heart failure as good as we can with the band. We will leave the patient to prostaglandin, see how that goes. And if the patient proceeds and comes to our surprise, the radiologist says, "Oh, there is the brain. Is, uh, there is there are big uh, problems with the brain. There is structurally, and the patient is just fine. The patient is just fine after two months. And then you pursue stenting, or you go you go for a delayed normal. That's fine. But I think." Um, there are very few patients. I would recommend personally to the family, go for compassionate care. Uh, there was one patient in our experience so far in Washington DC, patient came with a dilated heart, um, 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 uh, right heart, severe heart failure, septic shock, blood gate 17, um, and family said, do whatever you can. We put the bands on and the patient was on inotropes for a longer term. And then we said that that doesn't work. And then the family decided to stop. That is fine. But I would myself uh, in very few cases from the start, give the family the option for compassionate care. Hybrid gives you all the time of the world to decide on that in a few weeks, not right away. 
and uh, I, I see that as my as my job to give hope and not to give that way to them. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jan. It was a fantastic lecture, and I'm sure it would help us to grow our no hybrid Norwood program. It was a pleasure to have you with us, a real honor. And as Dr. Sandoval said, it was a great lecture. Thank you very much. I thank you so much. Uh, it was great, great, great experience for myself too. And uh, I would be happy, very happy. And I would love to meet you personally and uh, be, be, be inside of you uh, in the same operating room and help, help more patients. Uh, I would love to do that. Please feel free to uh, contact us if you have uh, any uh, uh, options. Also, um, send us colleagues to be with us in Washington, D.C. We would love to be also here. So we would love to accommodate colleagues who want to see our library. Okay, thank you very much, John, again. And say hello to Richard Jonas, David Watson, and Ricardo Munoz, and all the team there in, in National Washington Children's Hospital. Thank you very much for your, for your excellent lecture. And that's, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye.